Hello once again, welcome to um, this presentation. My name is Philippe Adu, I'm one of the methodology experts. And today we're going to have a discussion concerning granite theory. And um, I'm hoping that I can use one hour to present this. Um, and also, if you have any questions, you can ask me. And if you want us to also meet and have the further discussion, you know, you can email me and I'll be happy to um, have a discussion with you. So um, this presentation is based on um, this book called Constructing Granite Theory by uh, Dr. Shamas. And if you are if you are doing a granite theory, I recommend that you should get this book. It's very good, very informative, easy to understand. Uh, it also gives step by step uh, process concerning how to uh, conduct a uh, granite theory study. And also, um, I also recommend um, a video that um, uh, she was interviewed about uh, conducting granite theory. Um, study and she gave a very important and um, informative information that will be useful. So these are the two uh, resources I recommend if you are using Granite Theory. So for this presentation I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Granite Theory and I'm going to also give you the meaning of theory, right? Um, sometimes you all say that you are developing theory but we we may not be on the same page concerning what what do you mean by theory right what is theory um and also we will talk about characteristics of granite theory approach and also we talk about data collection strategies there are three main data collection strategies that you could use in granite theory and uh, we also have a discussion concerning data analysis process and i'm going to focus on these three main data analysis process like coding and lastly I'm going to talk about visualizing your um, theory after you have developed a theory maybe you want to report that theory sometimes very difficult um, easy for your audience to understand if you have a visual representation of the theory and as you also have a discussion concerning the theory that you're going to develop so um, introduction. So granite theory is a systematic process. It's a step-by-step -step process, but it's also a repetitive process because you go back and forth, looking at your data, um, reducing the data to, into codes, and sometimes have to go back to the data and see whether the codes reflect the data that you coded, right? Or the segment of the data that you coded. So it's the back and forth. You go back, you develop it, you go back again. Sometimes you have to come, go to the participant and interview them again to gain, to get more information to address your, um, the questions that you have concerning the um, data that you originally collected. And, um, this data collection process is very different because you are not technically collecting data. When you use the term collecting, sometimes it's a little bit of passive, right? You are going there asking participant questions and then they give you the information, you analyze and address your research question. Granite theory is very different. You are mining. This means that you are actively going and collecting all taking information or um, gathering information, actively gathering information that will help you to develop a theory or understand the phenomenon that you are focusing on. So, and this process is driven by your research problem or your research question, and also driven by the gaps that you identify in the initial stage. So when you first collect your data, you analyze, there might be gaps, there are, might be unanswered questions that you want to explore further and you go back again and interview participant or um, analyze document or do observation, right? So granite theory is very active or intensive data collection process. And um, at the end of the day, you develop a theory to explain or understand a phenomenon, right? So that's all about the granite theory. 
it's a systematic process it's back and forth repetitive a little bit um, you actively collect your data and then you analyze the data and then you develop a theory to explain a phenomenon or understand issue that you are focusing on so um, let's move to the next stage um, so uh, the same thing about the introduction so um, when do we use granite theory right we use granite theory to explain a phenomenon let's say you just want to know leadership right maybe you understand the uh, mechanisms of leadership the uh, assumptions related to the concept of leadership or you want to study bullying you want to study what is success right we want to study disability, discrimination, racism, loneliness, mental health stigma, right? You want to develop an understanding or a theory to help your audience to better understand or to explain the concept or the phenomenon that you are focusing on. Sometimes you can, you know, use granite theory when you want to examine an experience, living with mental health issues or homelessness or domestic violence. Sometimes you just want to understand participant actions or an event that took place or a process, step-by-step -step process, something that happened and you want to really document that, you want to understand that, you want to explain to your audience. And um, so in terms of your research question, your research question should be open-ended. Normally it starts with, right? how what or why so make sure that your action research question no no i'm saying action research granite theory research question should be open-ended right it shouldn't be close-ended right exploratory in nature so what is theory so um i'm talking about theory from in interpreted um, interpretivist perspective. <laughs> I hope I pronounce it well. I find it difficult to pronounce this one. So, so you are developing a theory. The theory is just an abstract description of how concepts are related. That's all. How the concepts are related, the concept that you have created, right? How are they related in explaining a, a phenomenon, action, event, a process? So you are developing this um abstract description that will represent the data that you have collected and that is will focus on describing or uh, helping you to understand action event or process right it's very different from the positivist perspective right which is where you you you, you it's just a, a preposition where you um, do observation or do um um experiment and then you measure variables and find out whether there's a significant maybe relationship between variables and other things it's very different right different from the positivist perspective this one you are developing concept finding out the relationship between concept and then bringing all the concept together and see how it that those concepts explain a phenomenon that you are focusing on so that's the theory so what are the characteristics of granite theory approach right so the granite theories should have no preconceived ideas right so this means that you are allowing the data to drive your analysis allowing the data to do um, information um, allowing the data to drive the process i think there's a question that comes in let me stop here and see whether there's any question coming um, uh, not a question. It's just about um, the slides. I've got a oh, okay, okay. So the slides you can email us, and uh, we'll be happy to send you the co a copy of it. So it, it's quite similar to some of the qualitative analysis where you have to bracket your background and pre knowledge, right? Your knowledge before, because we don't want that to influence your analysis and most of the time you don't 
you are not allowed to review literature before you call it and analyze data. I know there's going to be a lot of questions here because your dissertation, you have to write a proposal for uh, your uh, committee to approve before you call it your data. Um, that's a different thing, but when you are doing after your dissertation and doing um, actual research besides your dissertation is when you're using granite theory, you should not review literature first. You should um, collect your data, develop your, 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 your theory, and then you go back to the, uh, go back and review literature and see how they are related or uh, there's a similarities or difference between the theory that you have developed and then the existing research or theories, right? So there's no theory, uh, uh, no application of existing theories. You are not going in trying to apply the existing theory. You are going in allowing the data to speak to you, right? Allowing the data to direct you what kind of explanation do you want to come up with. And um, so the next point is, is analysis should be data driven, right? As I already said it, you know, you are collecting rich data, you are actively looking for information uh, to fill the gap that you have identified uh, based on the, your initial analysis. So actively searching to test, I, I put the testing in, um, so I put it in, um, in um i don't know the name i've forgotten the name so parenthesis i put it that way because um I'm, i was looking for a good word to replace test and i couldn't get it so it, it, test is uh, a, qu a quantitative kind of thing but i think you are you will understand what i want to say concerning you are actively looking for data right to test the uh, the categories that you have already developed and the potential theory that you have developed to, you know, and at the end of the day, you want to make sure that the theory represents the data that you have, right? So, and I will be also talking about theoretical sampling um, later on. So you have to conduct theoretical sampling. It's the sam second stage of sampling where you allow, based on the initial analysis, right, and the questions that you have concerning your initial analysis, then you go and look for people or look for documents that you can analyze to get more information, rich information to address the gap or the questions that you have based on the initial analysis. So the theory should use constant comparison method. So this means that you are comparing data to data, one segment of data to one segment of data, comparing participant resp responses, comparing the, your data to the category that you have developed. So it's a like back and forth, repeated, repetitive process, comparing and trying to find out whether that experience will help you to come up or with a theory or to adjust the existing theory that you have developed. And one also characteristic of using graded theory is um, writing a memo, right? So memo, we don't, we don't have a formula for that. You just have to write what you are thinking about. What do you, you ask yourself, what do you think is important to you as you are collecting the data? What, is, what are your observations? What are the thought process? What is really going on that you want to document, right? And um, sometimes you have to document the definition of the codes that you are developing, document how you categorize the codes into maybe themes or category, how you, come, you put the categories together to develop theories. This one will help you, especially when you are reporting your findings and people want to ask you, how did you arrive at the theory? You have to give them step-by-step -step process so that they will trust the information that you are presented. So it's always very important for you to document the methodology process, the step-by-step -step process, at the same time, your thought process, your reflection, great ideas that comes into mind. You have to document that. It is going to help you as you try to develop a theory and as you try to report or explain your findings. Very important. And you have to, you know, one, another one is the attainment of saturation. 
saturation here is very different from the traditional saturation the traditional saturation is where you interview participants and then you interview interview and reach a stage where no new information is being collected so you stop the interview that's the traditional one for granted theory saturation is rich when so what happens is at first you develop a theory and you go back again and collect information from participant or go back and collect data so when you collect the data you relate to the theory that you have developed right as you compare the new data to the theory if the new data doesn't cause you to change the theory then you have reached saturation you see the difference right the first one the traditional one is about data collection you're collecting your data from participant you reach a stage where you have reached um, um, everybody is repeating themselves, right? Bringing no new information is being gathered, right? You don't want to waste time. You just have to stop and start analyzing your data. But this one is very different, right? You analyze, you analyze your initial data that you have. There, there are questions that comes that you want to address those questions. There are categories that have been developed that you want to find out, you want to test, right? test and find out whether the categories that you you have developed reflect the information that you collected from participant so you do what you go back and collect some data and compare it with the categories compare it the initial developed uh, theory and see what is really going on oh i don't have to change the theory i've reached saturation there is a limitation concerning this it's very subjective it's the only person who can say that they have reached saturation is the person who is analyzing the data so there is there's no objectivity concerning this so it's like a subjective process, but you have to really do it such a way that um people your audience will believe what you found so you do you just say that our developer theory and i interview one participant and the person was saying the same thing we're reflecting on the theory and then i i i, I stopped you have rich saturation right so that's uh, the, some of the limitation of um, attainment of saturation. Um, it's, it's very subjective. It's, um, it's not objective. It's, it's you. For me, I might say that I have attained saturation, but for you, you might say that, oh, no, I haven't attained any saturation. Right? I have to go back and you know continue to. So I think the most important thing is to make sure that you ask good questions you ask yourself you make sure that all your questions has been answered so this means that you always try to look at your data that you have look at the findings is there any unanswered questions and then you can look at the existing data or you can go to the participant and collect more information from them so data collection strategies right before we talk about the main data collection strategies we just want to emphasize that the data collection strategy uh, is informed by ethnographic method. This means that for, if you are using granite theory, you should have to follow the principles laid down by the ethnographic, right? So this means that um, you have to learn more, a little bit about ethnography. So these are the main information that you have to note uh, before you do granite theory um, you, you collect your data so in terms of what constitutes granite theory approach i uh, know um, ethnographic approach so you are going to the field right where participants are located they are in their natural environment maybe in the classroom maybe in a community right you go there or a workplace and you actively search for rich information from them. You engage with your participants. Sometimes you observe them with little or no intuition, right? Actively interact with participants and data. So you call it data. So the data collect the data analysis start immediately when your first data or couple of data have been collected, right? You don't wait to collect all your data and then start analysis. Because as you collect, initially collect your data, you start thinking about, you analyze, and then new questions come, and then it, it will adjust what you're going to ask 
when you do are doing your next observation or doing your next interview right so as as you go to you are building a theory you are developing categories that will help you to build theory you are getting closer to the action spending time with participants building trust right so your data collection process should have some of the elements um, that I've discussed here, right? And I think that will help you to um, collect rich data from participants. So in terms of interview, right, uh, Shamas refer the process as intensive interviewing. It's not interrogative interviewing where you make participants feel uncomfortable as if that they have committed some crime and you are asking them questions, right? But intensive interview means that you are actively engaged in the conversation, right? You ask them open-ended questions, you give them time and a space for them to uh, bring their views without cutting them, right? Um, you can, um, you have to emphasize and empathize with them. You try to let them know that you understand their situation. You, sh you, 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 you have compassion because I know what you're saying. Um, and um, you have to be actively involved in the conversation. You are not going there to have my, you have five questions or 10 questions and then you ask them questions, those questions and then move away. You should be actively involved in the conversation, ask very um, rich questions that will help you to get rich responses from them, right? And you also have to open the gate where you can let them know that it's okay for you to come back again if you have further questions. I think that will be very important because you have to grant you have to go back to participant to ask more or find more information if any question comes up. Observation. Sometimes you can do observation. Um, so most of the granitary, they do interviews, right? But you can also do observation. I think the most important thing is based on the problem that you want to address or based on the, the purpose or your research question, do you think that doing only interview is enough or um, adding observation or document analysis will, would help a little bit, right? So you are not just going there to say, okay, there are three main uh, data collection strategies, so I'm just going to do all. Maybe observation in that situation might not work for you, or you might not collect rich information that will help you to develop a theory. So you don't have to do observation if it's not feasible. The same thing on document analysis or document artifact collection. Right. If you think that document analysis or document collection will not help you to get rich information to address your research question or to develop a theory, you don't have to do that. You are actively looking for rich information and ask you always ask yourself, where should I go to get the rich information to help me to develop the theory? And that's the question that you always have to ask yourself. So in terms of observation, um, you also have to decide. It's an active observation. So you are not just you don't want to be all over the place. You have to decide what am I going to observe, right? And do I have to participate in what they are doing? Or do I have to stand by and watch them? Will that affect the information I'm going to collect? Um, you have to take extensive notes. So the note that you are taking is, what do you see? What do you observe? And then what do you think? So your thoughts concerning what you are observing. So you are collecting two information. In terms of document, um, you, it's because the document was not written purposely for your study, you have to think about the authors, those who developed the document, right? What are their intent? What was the situation that led to the development of the document? What, who were the uh, audience? I think that will help you to better understand the document and trying to make meaning of the information there. So these are the three areas that uh, you could collect your data. So um, any questions, I can give you the chance to speak if you want. Uh, type in your questions, I'll be happy to address them for you. Um,
Any question? Okay, so if um, I don't know, can you all hear me? I'm. <laughs> I just want to make sure that you are um, um, I'm not muted. So, um, okay. great. So the next one is data analysis process, right? So after you have collected your data, initial data, what do you have to do, right? So the data analysis um, involve, you know, summary. You are trying to summarize the data. You are trying to examine the underlying meaning of the data try to reduce the data to abstract concepts right so what you're doing is that you look at each segment of the data and based on your research question or the based on the problem that you want to address um, what kind of information that do you need um, what kind of um, understanding is the information giving you what is the meaning behind that so you are trying to um, reduce the data in such a way that you'll be able to develop codes and categories and then you can develop a theory, right? So generally data analysis is all about re data reduction, making sure that the information that you have reduced to represent the data. So you are reducing the data into a small um, piece and then that small piece should represent the data that you worked on so these are the things that you have to think about so you have to be open um, to multiple interpretations right uh, multiple interpretation of the data so there's not going to be one interpretation so um, you look at the data you look at the segment and if the person says something um, in terms of your response to the question you ask yourself, what does it mean? What does this information mean? What what does it imply, right? What assumptions um, is associated with that information, right? Um, if a person says that, um, I live maybe I live day by day, right? Or a person says that uh, I'm fed up with life. If a person makes that statement, what does it mean? What is what is the assumption? What is the implication, right? So you always have to ask yourself a lot of questions that will help you to understand or interpret the data that you have, right? And you have to be flexible, right, in terms of um, allowing the data to drive you to look for more information, right? And also, you also have to uh, be aware of the language that uh, they use, right? Um, if, if you are interviewing um, people in a um, higher level of position um, or in, a, in, in an organization, they have some kind of jargons and words or explanation that they provide. You have to be aware of all that um, because that will affect how you interpret the data so the language matters so you have to be aware of the use how they use language um, I think that will be helpful for you because two people might pass through the same situation but the explanation concerning the situation might be different because they are using the different kinds of words to explain they express it differently but they meant the same thing right so how can you make sure that they are multiple explanation but the underlying meaning might be the same and this is where you have to be able to be aware of the kind of language that they use and i think that will be helpful for you i think there's a question coming uh, okay this is a problem Oh, somebody is asking, can I, uh, this is a private message to me, can I use Granitory if I have documents only as data? Oh, yes, you can do that. The most important thing is that the question that you always have to ask yourself is, is this a right 
um, source of information that will help me to develop theory to um, address or to, to understand the phenomenon, right? So it's it's you it's all about the availability. Maybe participant will not be available for you to interview them. The only thing that you have uh, the document, right? But ask yourself whether it's it's enough for you to you'll be able to collect rich information from participant and um, rich information from the data that you have, right? Um, most of the granite theory they use interview, um, but you could use um, um, document collection um, if that's the only source of information that you have. But you have to justify. So people are going to so why didn't you interview participant? Maybe you can say that oh this one is a sensitive issue um, that I may not be able to interview participant or it will adversely affect the well-being of participants. So the only thing is to focus on what participant have produced, right? Maybe they have made something, they have journal that you can collect and analyze. Um, so research is all about do no harm, right? You don't want to do harm. If you think interview will adversely affect participant, you can choose to do maybe, uh, maybe if they have recorded it themselves or there's something online that's public, um, publicly available, right? For everybody, you can go there and analyze that information and then you can get some info, um, be able to address or uh, develop theory. So in terms of the coding process, I know that a lot of people, you have read a, a lot of coding strategies that you have to use for graded theory. We have agile coding, open coding, selective coding. They are all good, but to I identify these three coding steps because it's easy to follow and you can arrive at the same theory that you want to do without any uh, sweat concerning following all the uh, some people have five steps eight steps right so these three steps um, is recommended by Shamas when you read the book her book you, you'll be able to understand all these steps so the first one is initial coding the name is initia when you first got, get your data the code that you started with it is initial coding this is where you identify significant portions of the data based on your research question or based on the problem that you want to address, right? And then you label them, assign a label to those questions, uh, those statements. So that will be coding, right? And then focus, I will talk more about each of them. The focus coding, as the name it right, is focus. So after you have done your initial coding, then you have to be focused, identify relevant and dominant or dominant codes. Right, and then determine, see how the codes are related to those the code that are not dominant, and based on that, you'll be able to do the categorization. Right, categorize them. At the end of the day, you develop some categories, and then you go back to the data and test the categories and see whether these categories reflect participant information. So you go back again. That's why this process is back and forth. When you develop themes, you are not done. You have to test it with the existing data, and sometimes you have to test with the new data to see whether the themes or the codes or categories will, will stand, right? And theoretical coding, as the name implies, you are developing a theory. You are connecting all the categories and bring them together to explain a phenomenon. So as Sama said in her book, coding should inspire us to explore inner assumptions in our use of language as well as that of our participant. Right. So that's very important information. So in terms of initial coding, what do you what, what do you have to do? So you have to actively engage with the data. Active engagement is question every information on the in the transcript or on the document that you have right looking for implicit and explicit meaning some meanings are implicit they say something but you say what do they mean by that what do they imply by that what are assumptions associated with particip this participant statement right 
uh, if the person said, oh, you know, for this, I'm never going to do that again. This statement, I will never going to do that again. What does it mean? Right. What is what is the as a implicit meaning what's an underlying meaning on that it doesn't mean does it mean that the person has given up or that is that the person that has learned from her mistakes that's why this she said she's not going to do that again right so you you're going to have more than one meaning and then you test those meaning okay let me take okay let me take this one the person might be uh, implying that a person has learned from their mistakes. Okay, let me see the previous, what the person said. Okay, based on this previous statement, I think this is the best reflection of that statement. Right, so you come up with more than one meaning and then you test those meaning and based on that, you'll be able to come up with very good label that represents the, from the data that you have, right? So you have to label the portion. So normally um, you have to do it using gerund, which is a verb plus I engine. That will be a noun, right? So example here is feeling determined, right? So let's say based on participant responses, they're talking about determination. You're going to fight this. Maybe the person have some kind of disease, and they are saying that yes, I know this is hard. I know people. I know that people have passed. Some people have passed where they are successful. I'm going to fight this one, right? So instead of saying determined, feeling determined, you're making the statement more actionable, making it active a little bit, right? And that will really help you when you are developing categories and theories, right? Maybe the person feel determined because of that, the person feel positive about the situation and then it helped the person to cope and then you see how they process it. So it's very important for you to um, name it starting with a verb with ing, that would be Jared. Um, that will help you to be able to and also help you with the consistency of your code right it's so consistent everybody everyone every of the code uh, have been arranged that way there are some time time where using gerund will not be possible it doesn't mean that hundred percent you have to use everything it should be in this form right it can be other form but try to make sure try to see whether you can do most of them this way. I think that will be very helpful for you uh, in your further analysis. So uh, Shamas recommend line by line coding, right? So we, do, we have different kinds of coding. You can code based on paragraphs, you can code based on sentences, you can code based on specific phrase, but line by line coding is looking, let's say you have Word document, let me see whether I can open something here and show you quickly. Uh, what should I open? Um, trying to open something that is not somebody's <laughs> document, but my, okay. So you can see here, line by line coding is, you code it line, so this line one, you code it. So you, based on this information, you label that, you go to line two, based on this information, you label that, you go to line three. So that's called line by line coding, right? So you're doing that, and, and somebody will say, that, yeah, this one is so difficult. I have about 30 pages of transcript. I'm gonna do line by line. How am I gonna finish? You can start initially by doing that. The reason why you have to do it is it will cause you to be engaged in the data analysis process. The more you are engaged, the more you identify rich information, the more you come up with very good labels. Secondly, you will, it will help you not to overlook some significant information where if you were to do it like um, paragraph by paragraph, you might overlook. So you, this is the paragraph by paragraph coding, right? So based on the information you code, right? And you may lose some very significant information in the middle because you didn't do line by line coding, right? So 
Shamas recommend doing live by line code initially. Recommend you know when you're doing it at the beginning, do live by line coding so that you may not, not be able to miss very important information. Maybe as you maybe after the first coding process or after a few of the um, analyzing few transcript, right? So let's say you have ten transcripts, you analyze five of them then you can see the pattern and you can see it, then you can may, maybe choose maybe paragraph by paragraph or sentence by sentence but initial one you have to do the lie by lie coding um so and you know the book also talk more about how to do it so if you can have access to it that that would be great so and then constant comparison method i think i've talked about this it's so important uh, it is it's quite the same thing, the similar thing about the importance of um, doing memoing is everywhere. You have to you have to do the memoing from the beginning, the time that you collect your data until the time you analyze your data. Constant um, comparison method, you have to use it when you are analyzing your data any level. You have to do it at the initial stage. So this means that you identify codes and sometimes you have to um, find out whether redo the examination again find out whether the codes that you have developed represent the information so go back and look at it again and represent the information that you have coded and if you want to know more about coding how to code i have presentation on that that will help you to get the foundation concerning the coding process because time is not on our side so i might not be able to um, go into detail concerning the coding process so the next one after you have done your initial coding what next focus coding right so you you assess your initial codes right and then you ask this question what is the practical meaning of the code what's the practical meaning what is the practical meaning so if you say that the person is being desperate Right, you coded it. What do you mean by being desperate? What specific action based on the data that you have can explain what you mean by desperate? What, what does a person do when a person is desperate? Actions, we call it empirical properties. So you have to define the codes that you have based on empirical properties. And that will help you to, when you're doing your assessment, you try to find out whether it's, you want to categorize them, you have to sort them, you already know the content. It's quite similar to quantitative operational definition, right? You know, when you're doing a quantitative study, you have your variable, you have to operationalize the variable, right? You, you, you operationalize, you give operational definition, right? What do you mean by? anxiety right so this it is quite similar what specific human practical behavior that would represent the code that you have and what are the underlying assumptions right if a person is desperate what should we assume what is the assumptions that come, come associated with that so this is also part of being active you know asking yourself these questions sometimes what will happen is that you may not get a complete answer and this is where you go back to your participant and ask them more information oh you know maybe the person talk about something that you label as in the person is being desperate right maybe you can go back and ask them more questions oh you said this one can you elaborate on more on that, that will help you to learn more about the code and also now know more about the empirical properties of the code. Then after learning more about the code and you have identified um, dominant um, codes, so maybe at the end of the day, initial code, you can have about 20 or 30 code. You look through all the 30 code, you identify maybe five or two or three dominant code. Dominant codes, uh, I have a presentation on this one. When you click on this link, I talk about sorting, right? 
So dominant means that you look at two things. A, a, a dominant code should, um, you look at how many times you apply the code to significant information in the data and how many participants are linked to that code. There are two things that you're looking for. Let's say you have 30 codes and about two of them, you assign a lot of significant information to that code. So let's say you assign 15 significant information to that the first code and the second code you has an assign, assign 10. And then, so they, they are potential dominant codes, right? Then you look at where are this information? What, what are the sources of the code? So what participants are linked to that code? So maybe you have 10 participants and eight of them were linked to that code. Then you can label that code as dominant code. It's dominant. What do you do about it? Then you look at the, the characteristics of that dominant code and see whether you can add the co other code that are left that has come up some kind of relationship with the dominant code and then you can bring them together and then you'll be able to form a category this presentation that has this link here um i talk into detail about how to do the sorting so it's part of the sorting strategy that you, you could use for your study right so at the end of the day you have you know come bring all some of the code together remember that um at this stage it's called focus coding so this means that there are codes that will you leave them behind you may have 20 codes you may have 30 codes and the only codes that are very important based on your phenomenon is maybe 20 codes so 10 codes will be left behind so that's why it's called focused you focus you reassess the code and leave the ones that are not necessary has nothing to do or has limited information to be part of the main issue so it lifts and then it focus on the ones that are very important in helping you to better develop um, a theory so you sometimes you look at a pattern right you look at um whether there's a relationship between some of the um uh, codes that you have and then you, you look at the gaps so there are some assessing the categories you can see that they are unanswered questions and this is where you go back to your participants or and analyze and collect more information so that you help you to better understand or fill those, those gaps and you can see that this one is also have a constant comparison so where you compare the categories with the data and other so it's a back and forth repetition all the time you know because developing theory is not easy it takes more time it takes more energy and you have to be excited about the process so that you'll be able to develop rich information if you are not excited if you see it as cumbersome it's very gonna be difficult for you to come up with rich information right you are not doing this because you just want to finish your dissertation you are doing this because you want to come up with rich information to help you to um contribute to the field right so and that will be very important so the next one is theoretical coding that's the last step right theoretical coding and as the name implies, you are developing, going to develop a theory, right? You'll try to integrate, bring all the categories that are important together and trying to see the relationship between the categories. Is the one, one category informing the other? That's the one category comes before the other, uh, one category under the other. So you ask yourself, what are kind of relationship? How do you find out the relationship? Empirical properties assessing the empirical properties for all of the categories that will help you at this stage too you might some of the categories might be left behind because they have nothing they are not really going to help with the development of the theory right so and then when you come bring them together you test it by going back to the data and see whether the theory that you have developed reflect the data that you have right 
So you can see that it's back and forth, right? You compare. Uh, at this stage, you may develop more than one theory, right? So according to Shamas, you don't have to limit yours. That's why there's a flex. You should be flexible here. You can come up with about four possibilities. The first theory, the second theory, the second theory, the third theory, and the fourth theory, right? And then you go back to the data and see which of the theory best reflects the data. And then based on that, you choose the best one. And some some researchers can just have one theory and go to the back to the data and then based on the information they receive, they adjust the existing theory. So you can have one theory to work with or you can have more than one theory that is explaining the same phenomenon, but you are looking for the best theory, right? So that's how this is going to be. And then so we're going to do the constant comparison again. It's repetition, repetition. So these are the three stages. If you follow these stages and you read the book, you'll be okay, right? So I read a book and I try to make it simple for you. So that's why I put together this presentation. And um, in terms of visual representation, some people are like me, I'm a visual person. So if you develop a theory and talk about it, I just want to see it, right? And there are a lot of uh, tools that you could use. You can use InVivo. Um, I have presentation on that, how to use InVivo to do some illustrations and other things. Um, you could use uh, Inspiration app. This is app that you can get in on your iPad or your phone, and then you can use it to develop some kind of diagram that will help you. You can use CMap. This is a free software that you can put on your computer and you can develop um, a, a, an illustration or a f feature that will represent the theory that you are looking at, right? And also I have a video on one, um, the one that I did, like a diagram that I did. It's not a theory, but you know, I just want to show you how it's done. And then you can use Word document, right? Smart art, you know, you can do that and you'll be able to, uh, the most important thing is that whenever you are developing an, um, a figure or you are developing an illustration, always think about your audience. You may understand, but that will your audience understand that information, right? So you always have to think about your audience as you are developing this one. You don't want to develop something that is very difficult to make sense of that. And also, when you develop it, you have to have an explanation so that people will be able to follow the diagram, so what leads to what, right? And I think that will be perfect for you. So this summary concerning um, analysis. So the process, so you start by examining your past, your background, your pre-knowledge about the issue, and trying to bracket them, put in a bracket, you know, trying to put them aside because you don't want the background information to adversely affect the analysis. And it's not gonna be perfect, right? But the most important is that you, you are aware of your background and as you are analyzing so that it will not unduly affect the analysis, right? And you start with the initial coding and you get your basic codes, right? And then you do the focus code where you identify some important codes and try to put them into categories. And then you go to theoretical coding where you bring them together to explain the phenomenon that you are focusing on. So this is one of the simplest way of understanding gratitude uh, analysis. And I think the book will help you. And also if you can listen to her interview on YouTube, that would be also wonderful to help you to better understand the granite theory. So this is what I have for you. Um, this is my contact. If you can email nk.me or you can personally email me, I can send you the PowerPoint. And I think, um, and if you want us to meet and have further discussion, I'll be happy to meet with you. So um, do you have any question for me?
no question then we can call it a day i think i was able to work within um an hour so that's a good thing um okay so Irene said thank you for a great presentation okay okay so patricia if you can email me i will send you the link uh i think i can even send let me see i have this link here that i can put here yeah i think uh, i've uploaded it on the website a slide share so um, if you can click on the link that i've sent to the chat box you'll be able to have access to it okay thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day thank you